Thank you, Lord. If you if you have your word, uh, if you're able, please stand and turn with me to the book of Acts. Amen. The book of Acts. Yes, Lord. We're going to look at the fourth chapter, Acts chapter 4. Amen. Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 13. Amen. Acts 4, verse 13. Amen. All right. It reads as, as follows. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Yes, Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for, for all that you do. We thank you, Lord, for who you are in our lives, Lord. Lord, today as I stand here and proclaim your word, please decrease all of me and increase all of you. Holy Spirit, continue to have your way. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Um, we're still in our faith series, Grace Center. Uh, today is part five of that series. And if you're taking notes, I want to come from the topic or the title, Bold Faith. Bold Faith. Grayson, there are a number of ways that uh, you can be bold. Uh, individuals are bold in a number of ways. For example, you are, you are bold if you decide to jump out of a perfectly running airplane. You are, you are a bold individual. It, it takes boldness to do that. You are a, a bold individual if you decide to place yourself in a steel cage, have someone drop you in the ocean, and you decide to swim with the sharks. Oh, you are a bold individual. You are a, a bold individual if you uh, go rock climbing without no harness, no, no net, nothing under you to, to, to save you or to keep you from hitting the ground. If you were to fall, you are a bold individual. You are a bold individual. If you decide to let someone strap your ankles with a rubber cord and you jump off of a cliff, oh, you are a bold individual. You're also a bold individual if you decide to have someone place a snake around your neck. I don't care if it's venomous or not. You're a bold individual. But do you know what else takes <coughs> boldness? Share the gospel. Yes. 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 It takes boldness to share the gospel. I want to take a little slight left turn in my sermon series on today as we talk about faith. Because so far when we talked about faith, we talked about making faith moves as far as going after our dreams and the desires that God has placed in our hearts. But there's something else that God wants us to do. And it's going to take faith to do it. And that's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Many people are afraid to share the gospel. They're afraid that they don't know enough. They're afraid that the, the right words may not come out. They're afraid that they may get rejected or maybe even embarrass themselves. So sharing the gospel 
it requires someone to be bold and to have faith. It requires a lot of people to get outside of their own comfort zones. To bring up the speed of what's taking place here in this text here, when you go back and read Acts chapter 3 at the beginning, what you see is, you see Peter and John, the disciples of Jesus, they are going inside of the temple. On a daily basis, they will go inside of the temple to pray. Pray. And on this particular day, as they're going inside the temple to pray, they, they come across this, this lame man. The man could not walk. Uh, they, they, they come across this man, and the, the word even says that on a daily basis, the man was taken to uh, the gate of the temple all the time. In other words, someone had to take him to this place on a daily basis. Imagine someone taking you everywhere you go. You know, we're blessed and sometimes we don't even realize how blessed we are. This individual was, was taken to the temple on a daily basis. And he was placed at the gate on a daily basis. But he had other people to take him there because he could not get there himself. Oh, he knew exactly where to go, Grace said. He, 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 knew, he knew where to go to, to ask people for money, because that's what he was doing. He was, he was asking for money. He was begging for money. He was pleading for money. He was panhandling for money. On a daily basis, he was at this temple gate to receive money from individuals. Well, on this particular day, Peter and John, they're on their way inside of the temple. And as they're on their way inside of the temple, the word tells us that when Peter saw the lame man, uh, he looked at the man intently. Uh, the King James says that he was fastened on the man. We don't know exactly what was going through his mind as he was looking intently with this intense look at the lame man. We don't, we don't know why he was pausing as he was looking at the man. Maybe God was downloading information into him by the Holy Spirit, but the word says that he was looking intently at this man. And when he looked at the man, he said, silver and gold have I none, <laughs> but such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus rise and walk. He says, silver and gold, I ain't got it today. But what I do have, I give unto you. Peter was willing to be used as a vessel to be used by God in that situation. In other words, he was saying that the situation you're in right now, money cannot buy yourself out of it. If money could Buy yourself out of the situation you're in. I'm pretty sure the money you have collected over time, you would have went to someone to heal you. But in this situation right now that you're in, the only one that can heal you is Jesus Christ. When he got healed, Grace Center, the, the people who saw the healing were amazed. They were in, a, in astonishment. They could not believe what they had just saw. For one, they knew that the man was lame. The word tells us that he was lame from birth. In other words, he was lame all of his life. He came out of the womb not being able to walk. So he was known around the neighborhood. He was known in the community as someone that could not Walk. So when they saw him walking, oh, they were amazed. Imagine knowing someone, which we know a lot of people, who are not able to walk, have not been able to walk in years, but all of a sudden, they're able to walk, they're, they're able to run, they're able to dance. Imagine the astonishment and the look on your eyes if you were to see that. 
That's what took place here in the text. The people could not realize, and they were astonished at what just happened. It was like, Ripley's believe it or not. They could not believe what they had just saw. A lame man from birth is now able to walk. They were just all over the place. But Peter, <laughs> Peter wasn't having that. Peter was upset when you read the text. Peter was upset with the people. Peter was like, now, now, first of all, don't say that I healed the man. This was done by Jesus. Because you do know all healings take place by the blood of Jesus, by what Jesus had done. That's how healings take place. So Peter was like, no, don't look at me. I did not do this. However, the one that you crucified did this. The one that was on trial with uh, Pontius Pilate and you had a chance to let him go, but instead you let a, a murderer go by the name of Barabbas. You you did this. You, you're the one that crucified Jesus Christ. You said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Yeah, the one who just performed this miracle that you're just in astonishment about, it, that, that's the same one that performed this healing right here. And you're, you can't believe it? Well, Jesus is the one who did it. Peter and John, they continued and they preached Jesus. The word tells us that 5,000 people were saved by the preaching Jesus. So. Word got back to the, uh, the Sanhedrin Council. Uh, the Sanhedrin Council Grace Center was something like the Supreme Court of today. It was a body of Jews. There's about 71 members, um, mostly Sadducees in the Sanhedrin Council. So when people went to trial, they went to trial in front of the Sanhedrin Council. So they, they were arrested and so forth, and Peter and John were placed on trial. For doing what? For preaching Jesus. Can you imagine going to trial in these days just for preaching Jesus? You know what happens in other countries where they cannot say Jesus out loud? They have to hide in basements, mm -hmm. do things by code, mm -hmm. because they don't want others to know that they're talking about Jesus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or it takes faith to preach Jesus. Yeah. One reason it takes faith to preach Jesus, Grayson, is because at least in today's time, it, it takes faith to preach Jesus because we have not physically met him. Come on now. Now, you have had a supernatural encounter with Jesus. That can surely happen. There are many people who have had supernatural experiences by seeing Jesus in dreams and visions. But for the majority of people, they have not met Jesus physically or even had a spiritual uh, meeting, per se, with Jesus, right? So it takes faith to preach Jesus. Now, Peter and John, of course, they walked with him. So they had the experience of seeing Jesus perform miracle after miracle after miracle. So, so they still had faith to preach Jesus. But another reason it takes faith to preach Jesus, Grace Center, is because you may face persecution or backlash. Now, back in those days, Proclaiming the name of Jesus was very dangerous. Uh, nothing like it is today when we talk about persecution. No, you're not being persecuted. You need to live back in those days. <laughs> being thrown to the Colosseum of lions and they just rip your body to shreds for proclaiming the name of Jesus. Now, people throwing you in a fire for proclaiming the name of Jesus. Being, being crucified on a cross just for proclaiming the name of Jesus. Oh, it was it was tough in those days to 
preach Jesus. But it's also tough in these days to preach and talk about Jesus Christ. That's why a lot of times when you may go to different events, they may say, okay, now you can pray, but don't mention the name of Jesus. I remember one time I, I, was, I was praying for someone and she didn't want me to mention the name of Jesus. I said, okay, let me see how, how this will work out for you. <laughs> but you can receive backlash and persecution just from simply preaching Jesus. As a matter of fact, the apostle John was exiled. He was placed on the Isle of Patmos from preaching Jesus. They did not want the Apostle John to proclaim Jesus around the majority of the people because they didn't want people to be converted to Christianity. So they isolated G uh, uh, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. But you do know that when you're isolated from the majority of people, get by yourself with Jesus, he will give you a revelation because by the apostle John being on the Isle of Patmos, God downloaded into him the book of the revelation. So you can be exiled and people can push you to the side from proclaiming Jesus, but still when you get all by yourself with him, God can still speak to you. It's dangerous to preach Jesus, but it's a good thing to be with them. Preach on, Pastor. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Peter and John spoke with boldness, and they had the courage to speak about Jesus, to speak openly. So as Peter and John spoke, the Sanhedrin Council, they said that these men are unlearned, unschooled, illiterate, ignorant. They call them all those names. No formal education. No formal training. No degrees on the wall. No plaques. No dean's list. No honor roll. No graduation cap and gown. They didn't even walk across the stage doing a graduate way. So everybody can scream their name. Oh, Peter. Oh, John. Congratulations. They didn't receive any of that. But well, Peter and John, they had the faith to preach Jesus Christ. And the members of the Sanhedrin Council knew that they had been with Jesus. The word says that although they uh, knew that Peter and John did not have any formal training, they marveled. They were amazed. It blew their mind. They could not believe that these unlearned, unschooled men had the knowledge of Jesus that they had. Mm -hmm. And they could only come to one conclusion. <laughs> that conclusion was, oh, these men, these two, they've been with Jesus. Because there's no way they can know what they know without them being with Jesus. And grace said, don't you know that the world will know if you have been with Jesus? Uh -huh. yeah. okay. Now, granted, they may not know it's Jesus initially, but they'll know it's something different yeah. about you when you get around them. They'll know it's you're not like other folks. You don't do the things that other people do. You don't say the things that other people may say. It's, it's, it's something, I can't put my finger on it. But it's something different about it. Have you ever received that from anyone? If you have, it means you've been with Jesus. <laughs> if someone has ever mentioned that to you, say, it's something of, what's, what's different about you? It's probably because you have been with Jesus. When you open your mouth and begin to talk, they'll want to know, how do you know what you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, Grace said we should spend more time with Jesus so the world can see it. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying go lock yourself in a closet in your room all day long reading your Bible all day. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm just simply saying that we all need to spend a little bit more time with Jesus. Amen. The world should be able to see Jesus just ooze out of us. Uh -huh. When we walk and when we get around certain people, there should be a different atmosphere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The atmosphere should shift when we get around certain people. The, the climate in the room should change when you walk into the room. Because if it does, it means somebody has been with Jesus. The Sanhedrin council was amazed at these unlearned and these uneducated men. And they realized that these men were not fake or phony, but they were the real deal. And since Peter and John spent time with Jesus, watch this, they had bold faith. Grayson, if you want bold faith, you have to spend some time with the Lord. Amen. You will not be bold in your faith if you do not spend time with the Lord. Let me say that one more time. You will not be bold in your faith if you do not spend time with the Lord. Let me be transparent for one, one moment. I notice that when I'm a little bit weak in my faith, mm -hmm. in my walk, I get a little bit weak. I notice that maybe I didn't spend enough time this week with the Lord. Yes. I, I, I did spend enough time in prayer and, 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 and reading the word for myself and not just for a sermon on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But when I Spend time in prayer and devotion. Oh, when I come out of that, it feels like I go slap a bear. It feels like I can just push a mountain and the mountain will move. I can speak to the mountain and the mountain will move. Oh, when I spend time in prayer and devotion, I can take on anything that come my way. It's almost like you're bulletproof. When you spend time in prayer and devotion and spend it with the Lord. You know, have you ever prayed about something for so long? You just, you just prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And when you get up from praying, you're like, oh, I'm good now. Yes. Everything is going to be all right. Yes. God is going to work it out somehow, somewhere. I don't know. Yes. I don't know when. But I spent some time yes. with Jesus. And since I serve a God that cannot lie, and he does not wear a watch, but when he show up, he's going to be right on time. Oh, yes. I got faith now. I can run on to see what the end is going to be. Because when you don't spend enough time with the Lord, you don't feel like running. You don't feel like moving. You feel like lying in your bed watching Netflix. <laughs> Lying in your bed watching everything on Hulu. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, but when you spend time with the Lord, yes, yes. you say to the world, world, mm -hmm. what you got today? Uh -huh. yeah. I spent time with my father. Uh -huh. I got chaos all around me. Uh -huh. The sand around me is, is shifting from left to right. But you know, I spent time with the Lord. So I'm going to use the faith yes. that I have. Yes. Anyway, yes, yes, yes. we all have to spend more time with Jesus from the pulpit to the pew. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look at verses 18 through 20 real quick. I'm almost done. Verses 18 through 20. It says, and they called them, talking about the Sanhedrin council, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But, I love buts, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to, to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. 
So as you can see, Peter and John, they were threatened to remain silent. Mm -hmm. And one of those reasons is because, Grace Center, uh, the, the, the Sanhedrin Council, they did not want to lose members of their own religion. That what it was all about. They did not want people to leave their religion and shift over to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So they tried to uh, uh, keep them silent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's a time when we must have bold faith, Grace Amen. Center. Amen. They tried to muzzle the disciples from preaching Jesus. You see, when people are threatened by you, They'll try to muzzle you. My Lord. Let me say that one more time. When, when, when people are threatened by you, oh, they'll try to keep you silent. They'll try to put a muzzle on you. They'll try to keep you where you're at. Mm -hmm. But we must have bold faith. Mm -hmm. Both Peter and John were full of the Holy Spirit. And Grace Center, if you're going to have bold faith, you need the Holy Spirit. Come on now. Mm -hmm. If you're going to accomplish things and if you're going to share the gospel with others, you need to have the Holy Spirit. He's the one that will, will lead you and direct you and give you clarity. He's the one that will prevent you from going somewhere that you may have wanted to go. He's the one that's going to open up the right door at the right opportunity, but we first must lean on the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to do everything that we do, and that includes sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've talked about this plenty of times, uh, about Christianity, and it's good to talk about it right here, especially when we talk about sharing the gospel with others. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that Christianity, we have the edge over other religions of the world. Oh, yeah. um, we have evidence that they do not have. Mm -hmm. The internal evidence and the external evidence. Just a refresher, or maybe new to some that have not heard this before, is that uh, we have internal evidence and external evidence. Mm -hmm. Internal evidence is what we find internally in the Bible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With all of the begats in the Bible. So and so begats, so and so begats, so and so begats, so and so begats, so and so. Everybody skip over them, and you're like, why are they even in the Bible? So and so, we got all this other stuff. Well, it's internal evidence. So when archae when they do the, the, the finds with archaeology, and they go dig up stuff and find stuff, people names are there. Oh, this is, this is in my group. This person's name is internally in the Bible. This person actually did live. This place actually did exist. So when you read those things, it's the internal evidence, as well as the different prophecies that were prophesied in the Old Testament, but were fulfilled in the New Testament by Jesus Christ. Internal evidence. The miracles of Jesus that happened in the Bible. Internal evidence. We have the internal evidence on our side. But we also have the external evidence. Things that are not in the Bible. Something called extra biblical evidence. That is, even in the days of Jesus, you had people who actually wrote things that was happening at the time. It's not in the Bible, but they it's like a journal that they wrote of things that was actually happening. Today I seen this man named Jesus heal this one who had an issue of blood for so long. It was a lot of people, and she was pushing people to the side, and she was healed. They find those different things through external evidence. So we have internal evidence and external evidence that can help us 
uh, when we witness to others, a lot of other religions do not have the edge on Christianity. Because we can all we can all say, well, I had this experience. That's why I believe in Jesus. We need more than that. Uh -huh. Buddhism, they, they have experiences. Uh -huh. Hinduism, they have experiences. Uh -huh. All these other religions have experiences. We need something else to stand on. Uh -huh. And that's the evidence that we have. So even when you're witnessing to others, you can have bold faith because Christianity backs it up with evidence. But watch this right here. Peter and John also had evidence. What kind of evidence did they have? They had the man who was healed. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, 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 watch this. Verse 14. Backslide to verse 14. Watch this right here. And beholding the man which was healed, where was he at? Standing with them. Standing with them. Standing. Not sitting. Not lying down. He was standing with them. Peter and John. Watch this. They could say nothing against it. They had evidence. When you have evidence, great sinner, they can't say anything against it. They would be bewildered. They may scratch their heads, but they can't say a thing against it. Verse 15 and 16, let's continue further here. It says, uh, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. We cannot deny it. We cannot deny what is taking place. This is what happened. I was in the room, but in my spiritual mind, this is what I believe took place when they got themselves together. They all got in a room together and said, hey, we need to shut these men up. The man that was healed is standing with them outside the doors. The, the, the people are switching from our religion to Christianity. Well, we have to shut this up quick. Now, we know it took place because the man, is, he's standing outside the door with them. So what can we do? We cannot deny the evidence that they have. Something is going on. Something has taken place. But we need to shut them up somehow, some way. Grace Center, some people will see evidence and it will slap them right in their faces. Oh, yeah. And they still will not convert over to Christianity. You can be blue in the face talking about this, talking about that, going line by line and verse by verse by scripture after scripture after scripture, talking, giving your own testimonies, doing all this stuff, and some people are not going to receive Jesus anyway. And although you may be bold in your faith and the evidence is on your side, some people are going to reject you anyway. But don't be discouraged. Amen. You spread the gospel anyway. You share the good news anyway. Some people will reject the truth even when it's combined with the evidence. The man was lame all his life. It was a notable miracle. They could not deny the miracle that had just taken place. But they still rejected the one who performed the miracle. So what do you do when people reject you? Reject Christianity? 
They call you all sort of names and no, nah, I, I don't believe in hell, I don't believe in heaven and all this other stuff. We we got this 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 poof ball. We're you know, we just you know, we go into the air, that's it, or we come back as a rat, or come back as a dog, or come back as a moose or a cow, uh, or come back as a Sally. Nah, but we don't believe in any of that stuff. What do you do when you are rejected? You do what the word tells us to do. When Jesus sent out his disciples and he said, when you go to someone's home, if they don't receive you, dust, the dust off your feet, go to the next town. Just don't, don't waste your time. You, 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 you share the gospel. You talk about Jesus. Okay. You, you, you plant that seed. You may water that seed, but they keep on rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. Dust the dust off of your feet and move on to the next one. Because there are other people out there who's going to gladly receive Jesus Christ. They're going to gladly receive him. They're going to gladly take him in and say, oh, thank you for witnessing to me. Thank you for sharing this. With. I did not know. There are many people out there who need the gospel. There are many people out there who are thirsty and they don't know why they're thirsty. They don't know why they're wanting more. Why they are, are trying to find more. It's like a, it's a void in their life. Like There's something more to my life. There's a purpose to my I cannot figure it out, but I'm here for a reason. Well, it may be that you need Jesus. Yes, and it's going to take bold faith yes. of all believers, not just the grace center, but all believers across the world right. to share the gospel yes. of Jesus Christ. Yes. Share the gospel, grace center. It takes faith. Mm -hmm. You may get rejected. You may be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You may even get laughed at. Mm -hmm. But you still must be bold. Yeah. I have talked with people who are just afraid to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. They love the Lord. Faithful believers. Mm -hmm. But they're afraid that they may say the wrong thing. Or they're like, well... I don't know all of the scriptures. I, mean, I barely know how to find Matthew. I, I don't know how to find Genesis some days. But, and they're just embarrassed. And they're ashamed. And they, they want to, but they are afraid to share the gospel. My advice is this. Just open your mouth. Just open your mouth. Tell them about how you came to receive Jesus. Because sometimes you can relate to others that maybe the pastor cannot. Mm -hmm. You can relate to someone that a minister or an elder or a preacher cannot. So you just open your mouth and you just let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does. Amen. You, we all need to have bold faith Amen. to share the gospel. Yeah. By Peter and John sharing the gospel, over 5,000 people were saved. Have you ever thrown a, 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 a pebble in in the lake or a body of water? Just watch the ripple kind of go down the, the lake. I wonder as I was studying for today, how many people are living today by the ripple effect of just this one story? Just this story, not, not, not the other stories, not all of the other people that were saved but just by this one story out of those 5,000 people that were saved by Peter and John how many people are living today that are saved from that ripple effect you may be on the job with someone who are saved because someone kept sharing the gospel because watch it if, if those 5,000 received Christ and they went out and shared the gospel and the next group went out and shared the gospel. And the next group went out and shared the gospel. You see my point? So I wonder the ripple effect 
of individuals sharing the gospel. Peter and John had bold faith to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be people that create ripples. We should be ones that are throwing stones in the lake and just letting it kind of go down the line. It takes bold faith to do that. You may be uh, apprehensive about opening your mouth and sharing Jesus. You may feel like you may not have all of the scriptures and all of the stories put together. Just open your mouth and let God do what God does. It's going to take faith. Absolutely it's going to take faith. It takes faith to do a lot of things that we do every day. It, it took faith for you to get in your car and drive here today. It, 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 it takes faith to get on I-285 and I-75 and I-20. It, it, it takes faith. Yes. It takes faith to do a lot of things that we do today. Yes. Just like it takes faith to share the gospel mm -hmm. to others. Yes. We should be individuals that will try to create the ripples for others around the world. To receive Jesus Christ. Because you don't know that by you witnessing to others. And if they receive Jesus Christ. How it's really going to impact their life. But not just their life. Generations after them. And you can make that impact. But it's going to take bold faith to do it. So it's more than just getting houses and cars and clothes and money and all this about having faith and I got faith and I got faith and I got faith. No, have faith to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your soul is more than a house or a car or money in the bank. Your soul will live on forever, but that house can go up in a fire. Your car can be wrecked. Your clothes can, can be ripped and torn to shreds. Oh, but your soul is going to live somewhere forever and ever and ever. But it's going to take bold faith for us to share the gospel with others. So let's increase our faith this year. You know, my wife would tell you, I'd go to a restaurant and I'd start talking to the waitress and I'd be like, yo, you, you, you go to church? You go to church at? Let me give you a call. I mean, you know, come see us. You know, you go to church, great. Stay there. If you're you're there, stay connected. Amen. We need to share the gospel with others. Yes. Amen. I'm done. I'm done. All stand at this time. The doors of the church are open. 